Congratulations, you've just overthrown the Empire, or won the Battle of the Trident, or consolidated the 24 Warring Houses. However you've done it, you've united a large part of Westeros, or Middle-Earth, our Earth, the Galaxy, or whatever, under a single banner. But now you must decide what goes on that banner, and that's where things get tricky. Back in 2017, when the world was young, and had yet to know the bitter sting of winter, the Templin Institute launched its first investigation into the world of exiology, or, you know, the study of flags. Now, just about five years later, and seemingly out of ideas, we return to discuss some more of the best and worst flags and emblems from across alternate worlds. First, though, I'm excited to announce that the Templin Institute has partnered with our friends over at Kaiser Cat Cinema to host an ongoing flag design competition. Starting right now, you can submit your own flag design to us via Twitter, along with as much of a description as you can fit into 240 characters. The winner will have their design produced and then sent their way so it can be prominently displayed in your home or carried into battle, as evolving circumstances dictate. There'll be a new winner each month, so if you haven't already, be sure to follow us on Twitter. And if you'd like to see the full details of the contest, you'll find all the necessary information in the description below this video. Okay, so let's quickly review what makes a good flag. According to the North American Vexiological Association, or NAVA, this comes down to five basic principles. The first is to keep it simple. Most of the time, flags are going to be waving majestically when there's a steady breeze, or hanging limply when there isn't one. Either way, the more complex a design, the harder it will be to identify. If a child can draw the design from memory, you're in a good place. The second principle is to use meaningful symbolism. Flags are meant to represent something, so it's important that every element, the colors, shapes, layout, or pattern are not arbitrary. They should be deliberate manifestations of history, heritage, emotions, or whatever else is important to those raising this flag. Next up, you should aim to limit the number of colors to between two and three. Any more, and they may be harder to distinguish from one another. You should also be careful that the colors you choose have effective contrast and work equally well when reduced to a black and white design. If your flag has three slightly different Different shades of blue, their subtleties are going to be lost pretty much immediately. The fourth principle is to avoid lettering or seals. This should hopefully be obvious. Not only will these complex shapes be quickly lost on a moving or hanging flag, but if you need to write the name of your country or whatever on your flag, doesn't that defeat the entire point to begin with? And lastly, we have be distinctive. This flag is likely going to exist in a world alongside many others, and it's important that the design stand out. That said, it is okay for flags to draw inspiration from others, provided there is some sort of connection between what they're representing. Now on top of those five principles, there are of course many other considerations. The width to length ratio of the flag, or even its overall shape if you want to abandon the standard rectangle. But we also need to consider the immortal words of Captain Hector Barbosa. The code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. While these basic principles are indeed a good starting point, it's entirely possible to craft a great design that breaks these rules. It's just important to understand the purpose behind these principles before you break them. Or, as Nava would say, depart from these five principles only with caution and purpose. It should also be mentioned that these rules pertain mainly to federal, provincial, or municipal flags. Those related to the military, and regimental flags especially, will have their own very different set of rules and traditions, so we'll talk about them next time. And finally, it also needs to be said that poorly designed flags aren't necessarily unrealistic. Bad flags, after all, are pretty common across our world. I mean, take it from someone who's lived in Kelowna, Vancouver, Lethbridge, and Arby's. I mean, Calgary. While an established interstellar state is probably going to have a very well-funded graphics department, a colony out in the borderlands might just have to make do with somebody who took an art course once in college. Okay, so which flags from alternate worlds adhere to these principles and end up with a great design? These are in no particular order, so let's start with the Kingdom of Gondor. This is a perfect example of how to blend aesthetics with symbolism. The most prominent element is, of course, the White Tree of Gondor, an important symbol to the race of men stretching back to the Kingdom of Numenor and the friendship that existed with the Elves. The Seven Stars represent the seven ships that first carried the Palantiri, or Seeing Stones, after Numenor fell, while the Crown represents the royal line of Gondor's kings. This is great. Every flag should have this same level of symbolism. And aesthetically, this all comes together very well. The tree is detailed enough to be iconic, yet not so intricate that its character would be lost when the flag is waving or when viewed from a distance. The seven stars and crown, meanwhile, help accentuate the shape of the tree. I also love the black field on which these symbols are placed. It's equal parts graceful and imposing. Above all, though, this flag is unique. Even across alternate worlds, it is immediately recognizable and unlikely to be confused with any other. 
Next on our list, we have the emblem of the Romulan Star Empire. This features a predatory bird clutching the twin worlds of Romulus and Remus. The symbolism here is pretty straightforward, but it's the distinctiveness of this design that I'd really like to discuss. If and when the Templin Institute annexes the North American Vexillological Association, I'm going to add another principle of flag design. Number six is going to be stop with all the predatory birds. Across alternate worlds, I think these are the most overused design element, and more often than not, the end results are generic or forgettable. Not with the Romulans, though. By featuring either an alien bird native to Romulus or some mythological creature from their history, this design stands out, and incorporating the twin planets into it adds another layer of symbolism. The emblem of the Romulan Star Empire is the ultimate exception to my no birds rule. If you simply must incorporate a predatory bird onto your flag, and you don't have the luxury of living on an alien planet, then you would do well to take some inspiration from the next emblem on our list, that of the Global Defense Initiative. Your mileage might vary on this one, but for me this emblem works because of its simplified and stylized take on the bird motif. This is not an attempt to represent one naturally, and as a result it stands out. Using a side profile also adds a feeling of agency or momentum which elevates the entire design. Contrast that with the emblem of United Nations Space Command, which while equally stylized, doesn't do enough to distinguish itself from other designs across alternate worlds. The emblem of the Karja Sundom is another design that really succeeds, even while breaking a few rules. It's a little too complex, I feel like a lot of these small details are going to be lost in the wind, but these small details are what makes it brilliant. The Karja are a post-apocalyptic society that has emerged within the ruins of a far more advanced world that they can't possibly understand. Just as many civilizations adopted elements from the natural world to use on their banners, the Karja too have drawn inspiration from the advanced technology all around them. They've taken a simple shape, but constructed it using the visual language of circuit boards, which to them, undoubtedly have some special meaning or significance. Even if we don't know the exact symbolism behind this design, it communicates so much about the state of the world the Karja find themselves within. Last on our best designs list, we have the state banner of the Hellgast Nation. Now this design should immediately tell you something, even if you're entirely unfamiliar with Hellgast history or society. The red, black, and white evokes the colors of various fascist or revolutionary movements, while the three arrows are reminiscent of both a Nazi swastika, the Jochen arrows of Falangist Spain, and the Arrow Cross of Hungary. Overall, it comes across as aggressive, intimidating, ambitious, and powerful. This emblem gets some extra bonus points though, as it has some interesting symbolism and history. Known as the Hellgast Triad, this symbol was originally based on an earlier symbol used during the colonization of Helgan. Three interlocking arms representing peace, justice, and freedom. When the new government came to power, it simplified the design and changed its meaning with the three arrows now representing duty, obedience, and loyalty. This is a great example of how the meaning of national symbols can change depending on the ruling regime. This design though is perhaps just a bit too successful. If a flag like this were adopted in the modern world, it would certainly provoke some controversy. The fascist ideology has been so thoroughly discredited that even authoritarian governments with fascist elements have to distance themselves from this kind of aesthetic. You have to imagine that every hellgassed citizen with even a basic knowledge of history might be asking themselves, Are we the baddies? <laughs> Alright, so let's move on to the flags and emblems that in my opinion really don't work. And we'll start with a modern incarnation of a flag whose previous version actually made it into the best of list in our previous video. The United Federation of Planets, circa 3189 or so. I hate this design. One of the things that made the original Federation flag so good was that the stars present in its central emblem didn't have any assigned meaning. They were not supposed to represent specific stars or planets. This implied that no Federation member was more prominent than any other. The stars simultaneously represented every planet and none of them. But the 32nd century version of this flag ruins that meaningful symbolism. Stars have been removed, one would assume because the Federation in this era has lost many of its former members. But given that the stars don't represent individual members, there's no need to remove them in the first place. As a result, this flag looks rather empty and lifeless with a bunch of empty space. Now you might say, ah, but that's the point. This is actually a great representation of how far the Federation has fallen. And you'd be right, but that's exactly why this flag should never have been adopted. What Federation president is going to their graphic designer with the direction, we want the new flag to evoke feelings of decline, loss, and depression, which is exactly what this design does. 
Our next design is kind of tricky because on the surface it's actually quite good. House Atreides. A few versions of their emblem exist, but I like to focus on this one in particular. Based on everything I've been talking about, this design doesn't belong on this list. It conforms to every rule, except for my No Predatory Birds one, but we'll let that go for now. What instead bothers me is, this design is too sleek and modern for the universe it exists within. Atreides is an ancient house within an even more ancient Imperium. The galaxy revolves around this archaic feudal system in which thinking machines are outlawed, and yet this design looks like it's fresh from Adobe Illustrator. It might make sense as a roundel on ornithopters or other equipment, but for the giant banners rolled out to mark the entrance of the Duke, I would have hoped to see a more complex, baroque design, something that breaks every rule, something like this for instance. It's a bad design, but it doesn't feel out of place. Okay, just one more predatory bird, I promise. The insignia of Spartan operations within United Nations Space Command is pretty bland. Aesthetically, the design is competent, but like many UNSC emblems, the inspiration taken from American designs is just way too obvious. Why is a special operations military branch using a bland copy of the seal of the United States? But what I really hate about this emblem is how it just seems to have avoided any kind of meaningful symbolism in favor of yet another bird emblem. You have an organization called Spartan Operations that is full of soldiers called Spartans. You might even say there's some parallels with ancient Sparta. So what symbol do you choose? Of course, a bird. The symbolism was all right there, but the designer took the first detour they could find. Like the Hellgast nation, the Principality of Zeon seems to have taken some inspiration from Nazi Germany. But they've gone a bit too far. They've essentially copied the naval ensign of the Kriegsmarine and then replaced the Germanic Eagle with their own symbol. I'll give Zeon the benefit of the doubt here. Maybe there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for why they've copied a 20th century fascist flag. But regardless, I still don't think the design works. Their unique symbol they've incorporated just doesn't fit very well into a Nordic cross like that. There's a bunch of empty, wasted space towards the bottom and very little at the top. It makes the whole design feel unbalanced and inelegant. I think Xeon needs to come up with something more accommodating to their insignia and stop ripping off others. We end our list of bad flags with that of the Chiss Ascendancy. Now right off the top, we do need to give them a bit of credit. Their current design is a notable improvement over their previous one. It still just doesn't quite work though. We can assume there's maybe some symbolism going on here, each circle representing a different planet in the Chiss home system maybe, but it's hard to say. There doesn't seem to be a strong relationship between any of the elements, and the placement just comes across as arbitrary. It's certainly not visually appealing. This is another design that feels unbalanced. You have to wonder what Grand Admiral Thrawn might think if he studied the artwork of his own people. So those are my picks for some of the best and worst flags and emblems from across alternate worlds. But even though I have raised a perfectly designed banner of victory atop a fortress of unassailable truth, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Do you disagree with my selections? Should every flag feature a predatory bird? And do you have any favorites I haven't mentioned yet? Let me know in the comments below. And if you'd like to put your own designs up to my judgment, check out that Twitter contest again in the description. So until next time, this has been Incoming. In Incoming, the Templin Institute discusses the theories and ideas found across alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards. 